Hi, welcome back to The Spark is Love. My name is Casey Pacheco. I have a very, very wonderful person. I'm so excited to interview him today. He is Dr. John Silva, and he is a doctor, and he is a nurse, and he is not new to the healthcare field. He, according to what I know, he's been in healthcare since the 1970s, and he has had many different things. So I'm going to welcome him in, and maybe you could tell us a little bit of yourself, John. Um, sure. First, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is exactly what we're trying to do is reach out and talk to people and have a discussion about what, you know, healthcare should be in this country. So yes, I, I'm afraid I am old. <laughs> I, I started at a very young age in healthcare, uh, 1974. My first job was actually a security guard in a hospital. Um, and then I just worked my way up orderly and ER tech and EKG tech, and I was a respiratory therapist for six years, and then um, I've been a registered nurse for the last 37 years. Um, I, I was basically just an agency critical care nurse. I, I minded my own business. I worked when I felt like working. I moved to a couple different states to practice. I wasn't really aware of anything, you know, geopolitical in terms of nursing and healthcare. I just, but I worked in tons of different types of hospitals. So I got to talk to nurses and see what their conditions were like, again, in a couple of different states, California, Virginia, Florida. Um, so I decided in the 90s, I decided, well, you know, this is obviously going to be my career. I've been yeah. in it so long. So I said, well, let me go get my bachelor's. Uh, so I went back in the mid 90s to get my bachelor's and I'm listening to these nurses coming back to school and they're complaining of the exact same things that were complaining about 20 years before. And so I started thinking in my head, you know, why can't nursing fix these problems? I mean, they're not unfixable, yeah. um, which led me into the politics of the, the political relationships in between nursing and medicine and business and all of this stuff. Um, so when I did my master's, um, I actually focused on politics and nursing mm -hmm. and uh, went up and did two internships in Washington and worked with a rep in Florida for a while. Um, it was a fascinating discovery process. I got to meet senators and talk to them and Congress people and talk to them and get their perspectives on nursing politically. Um, I then thought it was a kind of an image problem. So I came out and, um, issued a report on uh, proactive media utilization, trying to show nurses how you could use cheap media sources to get words out and get things done. Uh, and then I started uh, looking at PhD, you know, do I want to be a nurse practitioner? Do I want to be a PhD? And by that time I was pretty absorbed in the politics of, of health. Um, so I went for a PhD and this was a really unique, different outside of healthcare PhD uh, called the Public Intellectual PhD in Comparative Studies, which, by the way, was no small challenge for a registered nurse, I have to tell you. Um, but I ended up getting it, and through that process, I started running this kind of background program of what's wrong with healthcare and how can we fix this mess? Um, and I got to travel to different countries, and I studied their healthcare systems. And uh, so anyway, that's how that whole process started. And then I came up with this model. Thank you. It's a wonderful model. I, I'll just give you a little of my background. I'm coming from, I think it's amazing that we are actually connecting because I'm from a whole different, <laughs> I'm from a whole different era of nurses. I became a nurse in 2011 and I graduated nursing school. I was pretty young and very naive to the world. And I moved to New York City after I graduated um, from North Carolina. And I couldn't find a job in a hospital. I did not know that you needed a bachelor's degree and I had an associate, but I've, I, in my heart, I have been a nurse ever since I was a little girl because within my community, I would always take care of the elderly um, I, 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 ever since I was young. And so I have the heart of a nurse and I'm out here trying to find a job in New York City. And I was in New York because I was doing helping um, Chinese people learn about the Bible. And I needed everything I had to become a nurse in New York City. I used everything. So I ended up working for a Chinese company. So I had patients who spoke um, 
Chinese and Spanish and English because I'm Caribbean. So they sent me in all the places that nobody wants to go. And that was my first experience to nursing on a community level. And I, in New York City, I couldn't believe I saw all sorts of things. And I saw how broken the system was. And I interacted with the people who they really had no one to speak out for them. Um, their, their conditions, their living conditions, I realized as a nurse, it wasn't just a disease process or something being wrong with them, but so many social determinants really impacted the type and quality of healthcare that they were actually getting. So that was that's what fired me up. Now I'm in Florida with my family and I was um, finishing up my bachelor's degree and I was dreading doing a community, the community um, portion of the program. I didn't want to do it. I, I was in the hospital. I just wanted to get my bachelor's and, you know, move on. And I, something said, put your all into it. Go into it. Really find out what, are, what resources are there. And I was shocked. I was shocked to see. Um, there were some, because it, it is rural where I am, um, but I was shocked to see that there was not a really, there was not no nursing presence within the community, not, nothing. <laughs> we have two hospitals and they, they do what they can to contribute, but as, as a community, there was no nursing presence. And then coronavirus happened and I'm like, this is perfect time to get into the community, but in an effective way where I can affect change. So that's, 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 uh, my, <laughs> that's my story. You know, this is where one of the reasons why nurses need to understand our history. So if you go back to when nursing started in the U.S., uh, the post kind of Dorothea Dix era where, you know, where she was just getting it organized and set up, um, a lot of our original founders came out of social movements. Uh, Dorothea Dix actually came out of the fight against asylums and the way people were treated in New England. Um, and then we have the emergence of, and, and I advise everybody to really read about this lady, uh, Lillian Wald. Um, she's doing, she was doing exactly what you're talking about, which is direct nursing relationship with communities of need. And her nurses were climbing over rooftops in New York to get the people that uh, she wouldn't subjugate nursing to medicine or anybody else. Uh, nurses had autonomous practice to go out and, and deliver these health services and health education. Um, and that's really what I'm, I'm trying to restore, not just for nursing, but in the model of how we deliver health care, is this return to community health focus in partnership with public health. Um, I think when you combine public health and nursing, you have an unstoppable force. Um, the innovation of nursing is just unbelievable. And the data-driven information we can get from public health is unbelievable. And when we set up the communication channels where nurses on the front lines can communicate directly with public health support to get things in to start addressing some of these socioeconomic issues in healthcare, uh, again, the system just... Uh, you know, it's exponentially more empowered. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, going to the public um, utility model in simple terms. So I, I had to do some research on this because I had no <laughs> idea about how util how we even get utilities and, and at the price and the rate. So I was looking into it and I then, I, then I went to do some research. But I was thinking on a... Um, on a, on a lay term, how can we describe the public utility model to the public? Sure. So one, one of the problems, you know, it, healthcare, trying to understand healthcare is, is we tend to look at it as like 480 million different individual interactions between consumers and healthcare providers. And when I put all the models on the table after I'd written my goals that I thought a uh, healthcare system needed. Um, what I found out is that none of these models from around the world and certainly not ours uh, meet these goals. And, and I started thinking, okay, 
maybe I'm thinking of healthcare wrong. And what a public utility model is going to do is transfer that concentration on individual patient interactions to services that are delivered to a community. Um, and I'll stop at that point. So, because I want to go back and talk a little bit about how we got to public utilities in this okay, country. Okay, please do. Please do. Because there's a lot of parallels here. So once I found out that none of the models met the goals that I'd set out, um, I, I, I went back and I asked U.S. history and I said, we had to have had um, a problem in our country before where something was too important to be just a commodity, but we weren't really willing to call it a right. Mm. And this is kind of the world that public utilities live in. So if you think of utilities like Transport, bus transportation systems, water service, electricity. Um, these are things that we're not going to come out in the country and say you have a right to have electrical power. But what we did was created a model that was accountable for delivering electrical services to every community at a fair price. So when I went back and looked at U.S. history, I found the issue of electricity in the 20s and 30s. Um, you know, as electricity emerged, um, as it started off, it was really concentrated in urban areas, which a lot of healthcare is now. Uh, there was a horrible distribution of services. They were only running lines really to communities that could afford it, pretty much like healthcare now. They were neglecting huge swaths of America, particularly rural areas and some of the inner city areas, uh, again, based on economics, which is the same thing we see in healthcare. And yet F.D. Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized that, you know, we're going to become an electricity driven country pretty soon. We can't just neglect huge areas of the country. And so they took this model that had come out of England and it's called the natural monopoly theory. In other words, you give the service to an entity that has monopoly control over that area. And then you hold them accountable for deliver the service for delivering a service at an affordable rate that everybody in the community can afford and everybody in the community gets access to. So if you, if you think of healthcare as something that's, it's too important to leave to the free market. If you look what's happened, the cost of healthcare is just astronomical to everybody. I just wanted to put some data in here. Um, according to your model that you sent to me in 2019, when you say astronomical, $3.8 trillion was spent in healthcare. So I just wanted to put some statistics to what you're saying. Yeah. And, and you know, I stopped my, my doctorate for uh, a little bit to go back because I wanted to understand more about the economics. And I actually got an MBA certification from Tulane so I could understand the language of the economics around it. And when I did my look at what impact the public utility model would have on healthcare, I came up with a 42% reduction in cost. And you're right, if you're talking $3.8 trillion, a 42% reduction in cost is significant. That is. So yeah, 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 no, it's, it's out of control. It's, uh, it's gonna be 18, 19% of our gross domestic product pretty soon. That, that is, and you know, you know, I, and I hate to cut in, but what you're saying is so spot on. And the model that you created, you know, it, it really targets the delivery system of healthcare. Um, many people argue that um, we're spending so much money on healthcare, yet still we don't, we, our population is not getting any healthier. Oh, it's getting horrible. Um, you know, it, there, was, there was an economist that did a study who said that we could cut a third of our healthcare costs if we could just get back to 1980 obesity levels. Um, where the American healthcare, uh, the status of American health is horrible. So this is where my program is targeting, where I don't, I want to go in and I know, I know there's a lot of work to do with the delivery of healthcare, but where I want to target is the whys. It's to, there's a lot of um, lack or gaps in education, but there's a lot of things that the help, the, the, the public knows, but they're not doing. So what I, what I have said in the past is that our 
thoughts and our consumption of healthcare is not sustainable. And as nurses, we see that we, we do our best in, in a 12 hour shift, we do our best to take care of our patients. But then we realize they walk away and they just continue the same habits that got them where they were before. So I'm really targeting the, the not just the delivery, but the reception of healthcare, the, con the consuming of healthcare. It's sort of wasteful where, where doctors and nurses be, have become very dispensable. And, and now you have this, um, this new era where there's a lot of people talking about becoming a health coach and, and, and offering counseling. But as healthcare providers, we can and should be doing that. But we are not in a position because we ourselves are not healthy because we're subjected to an unhealthy environment. So it's taken me a while, but I, I really, I think our thoughts together is enough to change an entire system because not just the delivery, but the people who are actually accepting the healthcare, if, if they can take personal responsibility for their health, if every American takes responsibility for their health, and then you have a new service delivery, then we will have a new system. Yeah, and, and, you know, one of the big problems we have now in healthcare is just the uh, deterioration of primary care. And one of the big problems we have is everything in healthcare has to be funneled through this finance system of uh, insurance reimbursement. Uh, in my model, there'd be no insurance. You'd, nobody would need insurance. If you need healthcare service, you come in and get your healthcare service, whatever that is. So there's no insurance, there's no co-pays, there's no premiums. Um, things are uh, paid for at every level. So in other words, federal government still pays money, but a lot less than they are now. States, uh, some of them are paying 20% or more of their uh, state budgets into healthcare. Um, I would drop that well under 10. Uh, cities, counties, the same thing apply. And individuals and businesses and corporations. Every Healthcare is a social uh, issue mm -hmm. and everybody has to chip in. And if everybody chips in, um, we can put up a healthcare system that will be community focused, that will be able to provide preventative services to communities so we can go in and spend resources educating people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing this does is this model then becomes empowered enough to take on um, social and economic issues. For example, we have to address our food industry in this country. Um, food, you know, we, well, it, it, you know, it's been said a long time that uh, we live in a country where medicine knows little about nutrition and the food industry could care less about our health. And that's really true. And if that means taxing some of this stuff with high fructose corn syrup and the excess sugar and sodium that's being dumped into it, then so be it. We'll take those resources and put it into health services. Um, we have to address the food desert issue. We have to address smeltering plants right alongside communities. You know, yeah. And, you know, no wonder there's, 48 kids in that area that have asthma. You got a smeltering plant sitting right next there. So we have to empower the healthcare system to be able to address a much broader range of issues than the fact that Timmy has a cold. Yes, you, you know, um, John, I, I have to tell you something. Um, I became a YouTuber because I realized and uh, one individual has great power to change an entire system without even being a threat to them. I realized that a lot of these businesses, even the businesses that got into healthcare, they realized that people, people, they're just going for profit. So wherever, whatever people want, whatever consumers want, that's what they're gonna address. So, you know, I'm African-American and for a long time, our hair, our natural hair, it has been, we've been using relaxers, we've been using different products that, because we didn't really have products that catered to us. And on YouTube, <laughs> some brave young woman decided, let me show people how to, how to, how to comb my natural hair, how to, how to make products, how to develop. 
and it became sensational. It took off. And now you go into the store and you look on the shelves and you see there's actually an entire section dedicated to African-American or ethnic care. And that was really inspiring to me because I said, what if, what if we can influence people to really take a look at their eating habits? A lot of what we eat is not just um, what's in the grocery store, but what's in the grocery store is based on what we buy. And we buy it because we have emotional ties to food that is unhealthy. We have emotional ties where our kids, they, they want the McDonald's, they want the Burger King. And I'm, I'm not saying that I don't eat that stuff. I, I used to, but I, it, a change had to happen within me first. Within, and, and, and that's where I'm really trying to push out education um, to communities, to individuals, because I, I feel as though if we say we want different, then they'll start producing differently. I don't know. What's your take on that? Well, you know, we've basically known since the 60s how to improve your health, right? Get exercise, don't smoke, don't drink to excess, you know, be careful what drugs you put in your body, eat a balanced diet. I mean, we've known all this stuff. This, is, this isn't some revelation from 2021. Um, so there, there's a lot of different factors that go into this. One of this is how things are marketed. Um, so when you go into stores, for example, items are placed at eye level for particular reasons. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of marketing campaign within the food industry. Um, there's a lot of getting kids and young kids kind of hooked onto these foods, especially sugary foods, um, so that that maintains itself up through their adult years. So there's a lot of different things we have to address. Um, the food desert issue. There's just too many communities that don't have access to fresh foods. That, so empowering people to make decisions, but then providing them the opportunity to act on those, yeah. uh, that information. Yeah. Um, those are kind of two different issues. Yes, yes. And, and it's two different aspects of, of, of you know, it, it's, it's two different things, but I think they're equally important to be addressed. Yeah and change. You know, going back a little bit to history. Now, I have to, I have, I, I do want to bring up something that you wrote um, in your, in your, your paper on your, your article about public utility model. It was absolutely fascinating to me. It was the 1935 film Captain Blood. <laughs> I never heard of it before, but it was remarkable because there were some things said in there. Um, now, I, I had to go back and look and I thought it was actually a play, um, but it was based on a book um, by Raphael Sabatini, mm -hmm. and he was into historical fiction. And this it got really interesting to me because I've been doing um, history. I, I, I love history. And I think because we haven't paid enough attention to history, we're in the space we are in right now. But Dr. Blood, you made some really good references about what he said. Well, I, I've maintained, and in, in, in this was really coming out of a discussion of who should be in charge of this healthcare system. And my point was that I thought the chair of the regional council should be a registered nurse. Um, and it's not to denigrate medicine. I mean, medicine is obviously you know, a critical partner in all of this, it's healthcare. Um, but to me, medicine suffers kind of from two philosophical inherent flaws. Um, one of them is a hubris, uh, a belief that they and only they kind of understand healthcare, that they and only they um, are in a position above everything you know, the, the purity of the doctor patient relationship and the disengagement with what's going on in society, this patient, this moment right now. And the other philosophical flaw in medicine is this uh, fear of competition. This, and we see this for decades now with the scope of practice battles that, you know, in just about every state, 
uh, the real slow delayed emergence of nurse practitioners in all 50 states. Um, and it's this professional protection, I guess I think would be what I would call it. You know, and medicine won their war. They won the war 100 years ago. They're still fighting this same battle of trying to fend off competitors. So in Captain Blood, there's two images of the doctor that come out. Captain Blood is himself a physician, and we see him at first. He's, you know, disengaged from the social revolution that's going on in England. He just goes out to take care of this patient mm -hmm. and ends up getting swept up in the whole thing, sold as a slave, where he finally has to confront the social uh, inequities. And he uses his intelligence to become successful in that effort to confront these, um, these horrible forces. So that's kind of that image. But in the process of doing that, he threatens two physicians that are on the island because he's a much better physician than they are. And you see in that movie, these two guys actually risk being, you know, jailed themselves and enslaved themselves by giving him money so that he'll leave the island so they don't have the competition. So the movie just to me perfectly reflected these two uh, philosophical flaws. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I, I, I actually did some research because um, according to the paper, um, Captain Blood was sent to Jamaica. And that was interesting because I came across some history that I didn't know, and I don't think many people did know. Um, there are about four or five nurses. They used to call them doctresses back then, and they were all slaves. Grace Dawn, Cuba Cornwallis, Mary C. Cole, Sarah Adams, and Mrs. Grant. And a whole century before Florence Nightingale, these women, they actually set up in Port Royal and they took care of plantation owners, they took care of the um, British naval soldiers um, who would get diseases and they would use their herbal practices and traditional medicine to take care of these men. So much so that um, Cuba Cornwallis, she took care of Horatio Nelson and Prince William Henry, which is William IV. And wow. she saved their lives and she was a slave, but um, our history as Africans um, in the in the West, it's not it's not known, and because of that, a lot a lot of nurses are lost, and a lot of nurses feel like Doctor Blood, where they don't want to be in hospital politics or any politics. They just want to take care of their patients. They just want they just want to do the right thing, and it does not matter who it is they're caring for. They just want to take care of people and stop seeing people sick or on these chronic, you know, they, the chronic diseases where they don't have to be, but they're caught, caught in a system. Yeah, and that's why, you know, in this system I'm proposing, it's, it's actually an interdisciplinary practitioner-led administration because if you go into the ethics in all of our professions, occupational health, physical therapy, pharmacy, medicine, well, medicine, uh, nursing, uh, integrative healthcare practitioners, whatever you go to, the core philosophies we all have is in taking care of our patients, making sure that services that we can offer are delivered. Mm -hmm. the, the payment system tends to be kind of outside of what we really think about as practitioners. And that's one of the reasons this thing says that, you know, this practitioner led administration is going to be set up a system that is congruent with their values and allows them all to maximize their skill sets so that everybody's bringing everything to the table for our communities. You know, it's very interesting that you said that because that, that was actually my warning to nurses. If we as nurses, if we don't stand up, I really think my, my personal thoughts, just my opinion, is that nursing is the future of healthcare um, because nursing directly affects the delivery of healthcare. We coordinate everything <laughs> when it comes to health. Um, so I think as a nurse, if we don't stand up and we say, I need to be more than a pill pusher, I need to be more than doing whatever 
rhetoric or whatever slogan or whoever's agenda, I need to stand within my profession to advocate for the health of my patients. If we don't do that, what's going to happen is we're going to be quickly um, irrelevant because with technology now, um, things very easily you can you can replace. If you're just a pill pusher, if you're just giving people pills, you, you have med techs or you could have technology where the pharmacy gives you single serve, you know, for every patient that gets delivered automatically to them. So as nurses, we really need to practice to the scope. We need to bring that caring, that, that humanity back into nursing. And we need to do it sooner rather than later. And I think if, I think if more nurses get on board and, and not just be, not be so afraid to lose their job or to, to find this favor with administration, but really use their voice and to, to advocate for healthy outcomes. Yeah. You know, and, and nurses need to understand this would be, I, I can't even tell you how easy this would be for us. Uh, the group I set up nurses transforming healthcare um, is actually um, just by, you know, and, and I keep trying to tell nurses this, if only one out of 10 nurses, one tenth of the nurses in this country would join us, uh, five bucks, 10 bucks, what do I care? Um, if only one tenth of them, we'd be the largest nursing organization in the world. We'd have a seat at the International Council of Nursing. We'd be over twice the size of the ANA. And that's just if 10% of the nurses would, you know, and, and I'm not asking people to go out and carry signs in the street. You don't even have to register your name if you don't want to. Uh, I get it. I, I've been through, you know, 40 years of this. I've seen nurses forced to take um, state nursing association pins off their uniform. I, I've seen nurses that got blackballed because they had the audacity to talk about unionizing at a hospital. Um, I get it. There's, a, there's retribution. But at some point, like Captain Blood, we have to come off the sidelines and we have to get in the game and we have to understand that this is hardball. These other groups, uh, Big Farm, uh, American Hospital Association, even our own nursing leadership groups are, are not playing around. This is, this is a serious war to them. And they're taking on all comers which includes nurses that are trying to get out and actually make some changes in the communities. And then you're running up against these systems mm -hmm. that really dominate the payment delivery uh, for services. And it just becomes this kind of futile effort to try to disrupt or innovate or hack or whatever they want to call this thing. Um, so until we change those entities, the fact of these, you know, massive insurance overheads we have, and then these kind of dysfunctional, isolated facilities um, that aren't really systems at all. Um, they're just focusing resources in areas where they know they can make a lot of money. Yeah. So until we change those things, and again, one-tenth of the nurses, there's four million of us in this country. If just one out of 10 would come in and help, um, we'll, do, we'll do the heavy load. Uh, I have a tremendous group behind me. Uh, we'll do the heavy lift. We'll, we'll push the boulder up. There may be a point in the future where we call on teams to come out and say, you know, go to the, see their reps or something. Uh, but right now we'll do the heavy lift. Uh, but we need that. We need those people to come off the sidelines. You, you know, um, John, I'm coming from a space where um, I'm coming from a space where we live in an abundant world and there is enough for everyone. And I think, um, as I think about that, and as I think about interacting, especially getting into the businesses and encouraging them to, you know, and their employees to be healthy, I think about the, what is in it for me? And a lot of people, you know, I don't think, you know, usually people say it as a selfish thing, but I don't think it's a, a bad question to ask what is in it for me? And for those nurses, you know, so many people are trying to become nurse practitioners so that they can practice 
independently. Um, so many people are going back to school because they're realizing even though they're, they're supposed to have a voice, they don't really have a voice within the system. So a lot of people are progressing, but I'm not against, I'm not against progressing. I, I support all my nurses. I support everyone in every dimension. But I, I want them to know that where they are right now, whether you're a nurse in the nursing home, whether you're a nurse in administration, whether you're a nurse at the bedside, you're enough. You're enough right now. And your voice and your experience is enough to expect change. So they, you know, a lot of people say, well, what is in it for me? A lot, a lot is in it for you. And for the business people, what is in it for them? A lot is in it for them. Because as a nurse, I tell you, I have taken care of nurses. I've taken care of doctors, lawyers, NBA players, NFL players, prisoners. I have taken care of just about every sort of job or employee or and everybody is affected by the healthcare system it can bankrupt you i have seen yeah. it i have cried with families unable to pay but people don't realize this over 50 percent of the bankruptcies in this country are because of health care yes that is serious that yeah. is serious and that money your employers pay in to cover you in insurance is money you should be earning you should have access to that should be in your salary. Yes. And, and the, the thing about the thing about it, I feel as though currently um, for me personally, I'm not saying that I'm healthy, but I'm pursuing health because what I realized is that in the past, you know, growing up, they say get a good education and you want, you want it as good as it gets so that you could pursue wealth, but health is your wealth. And being healthy holistically affects every dimension of you. It affects your finances. It affects your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual health. So pursuing health is, is the goal that I'm stretching forward. And I'm encouraging not just people in the community, but my, my fellow workers, my fellow nurses, my CNAs, I, I, I want us to be healthy and to know what healthy means. And to know when you call out um, of work because you're sick, it's not just because you're <laughs> coughing, you know, <laughs> on the verge of collapsing, but, but being sick or being unhealthy Spans, it, it it surpasses just physical. It it surpasses a physical mm -hmm. dimension. So that's that's where I'm going. And you know, and one of the worst contributors to this, honestly, is chronic stress. Mm -hmm. We're you know we're organisms that are absolutely designed for running away from the tiger. Short term stress. We we are custom built for that. Yes. We are not designed for chronic stress. And there are many groups in our country who live under chronic stress. Um, I'm sure you can identify several. Um, and anybody that denies that that is not true is not living in this country. So we've got this situation where in certain populations, not only do we limit access to health services and limit access to preventative strategies and exercise areas and all of these other things that we know contribute to health, but then on top of that, we burden them with this heavy stress load. You know, if you have to educate your young child about how to live through an encounter with a police officer, you tell me we're not living under some kind of weird stress in this country. So we have to address holistically. And that's another one of the things that this model delivers is that removing from practitioners that burden of throughput and nurse practitioners find this too, even when they open their own businesses, they're still subject to these reimbursement things. Mm -hmm. And so that means you got to see X amount of patients every day to meet your overhead and all that. Mm -hmm. um, if you can think of that as setting up integrative health facilities in communities, then you become a trusted voice in that community for health services. And people are going to start, I, I would think, uh, Basically, at some level, they want to start addressing their health. 
And then the combination of the public health, the universities, the healthcare delivery system, the states, we can start addressing some of these social uh, causes of, of bad health. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you had um, any experience with um, the phrase, well, there's a saying, nurses eat their own. Do you think that, <laughs> I don't know if you have, have had experience with that. No. Uh, what, what I tell my students is that if you go out there and act like a jerk in your first job at a nurse, you're going to find nurses are going to be going, yeah, good luck, kid. <laughs> um, if, you know, and this was really dominant uh, at a time when nurses were starting to get their bat- baccalaureate degrees at a big level. And they'd come in and they'd be working on floors with people who'd been nurses for 20, 25 years who had diplomas and associate degrees. And these baccalaureate students would say stuff like, well, I'm not going to clean up the patient. I have a bachelor's degree. And these nurses are looking at them like, listen, sweetheart, you're a registered nurse. If that patient needs to be cleaned, you need to get your own butt in there and do it. And that kind of friction uh, was kind of... um, I don't want to say prominent, but it was kind of evident in, in, in nursing practice. On the other hand, if you came in there and you were kind of humble and you went to nurses and said, listen, you know, I really want to learn Um, because when you come out of school, you're not prepared to take a load in the hospital. You need to learn things. You need to work with other people. This is part of becoming an expert nurse Mm -hmm. um, is understanding and seeing over time and experiences and everything that contributes to us being experts. So if you come in with that attitude of, of humility in your own practice and wanting to learn things and being willing to help people, people are going to help you. Um, I, I have found nurses, you know, and I've worked with uh, a couple uh, over the years, um, pretty, pretty receptive and, and pretty focused on what they want to do in terms of delivering good care. I, I, think, I think I have seen... Um, and in my short span as a nurse, I have seen where nurses have eaten their own, but I, I'm, I'm seeing that we're moving towards, instead of competition, collaboration. And I think a lot of it, when our friends become nurse practitioners, we're genuinely happy for them and we want to see them succeed. And we see that they're in a different pond where now they're up against physician assistants, physicians, you know, and they're trying to make their own. And as nurses, we're encouraging them. And I think it's shifting the the climate for nursing where we're more in collaboration. And I I, I think at this point in time, I will tell you, um, John, my husband is in nursing school and he's almost, he's almost a senior. He's on, he has one more semester to go. And I think I think this is the time where it's easy for people to not like shy away from the nursing field, but with the technology increasing with people's attitudes to what healthcare shifting, I think it's a great time to be a nurse because I think nurses need, according to your um, public utility model, if you're going to have nurses in places um, of administration and oversight, you're going to need nurses with many different backgrounds and many different strengths, not just uh, <laughs> before we would say, if you have good bedside manner, you're, you're a good nurse, but you may have a nurse that doesn't have good bedside manner, but they love, they love the, um, the historical or the, the, um, the theories in nursing and they identify with it but they're great at technology or they're great at business or they're great at marketing. And we need those people and we need to start embracing them instead of weeding them out because they don't have a good bedside manner. I I think that's, you know, I talked earlier about me um, and I, I used to call it moving from nurse to nursing. In other words, taking the focus from us, not just on our individual patient, but understanding broader issues like healthcare and what nursing can do in healthcare and becoming that socially active force. And, but in doing that, I also want nursing to be a socially active force. In other words, I am not in favor of baccalaureate entry into practice. Why would we deprive tens of thousands of people who would have no chance whatsoever of getting into major universities 
the opportunity of starting with an associate degree, becoming that red professional registered nurse, moving up then and getting their bed. And if you want to say, you know, within five years, you have to have a bachelor's or something, fine. I don't care about that. But I teach in an ADN program and I see these students come in that literally would have no chance. They're in three, four, five year waiting lists to get into these, even the community colleges, the the universities cap off how many they admit. They cap off how many times they admit a year. These ADN programs, and again, I, I do think we need better scrutiny of them, but these ADN programs are bringing these people in and, you know, we all pass the same exam. We all pass the same NCLEX. Mm -hmm. um, so our field then would become this mobilizing force of being providing opportunity for people to get into nursing and then move into bachelors and nurse practitioners and advance themselves as well. Uh, so I, I don't want to lose that either. No, and I, I agree with you. I think many nurses have agreed with you over the years. Um, our voices have not been heard <laughs> um, because they do what they want to do. Um, and I think, I think at this juncture in time in 2021, I think um, <laughs> I'm a millennial. I'll tell you, I'm a millennial, and we we are we're we're waking up and we're realizing that um, we we can do something. We can do something about the future and the future for our children, and we can deliver. <laughs> we could deliver a better model of healthcare, um, what you call a nursepreneur, where I'm basically starting up a concept that is very new and very different. I've had people say, nurses, I didn't know they can do this outside of the hospital. So it, it's, 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 it has its challenges, but I, I think when we have support from nurses who've been nurses for a long time and maybe they, they didn't give up because you could have given up. You could have said, nobody listened to me. I did all of this. I have all this and I'm just going to throw my hands up. But you didn't give up. You're here supporting us. <laughs> well, you know, I was at a big university where I'd have, I'd have classes of 90 students in an auditorium. And a lot of my students were millennial type students. Um, and I'd have, you know, other faculty sitting me down going, hey, you know, you can't just go in and talk to these people. You, you have to stop every 15 minutes and let them use their telephones in class. And we have to do these creative billboards. And that has not been my experience. You know what? If you go in in a reasonably entertaining fashion and <laughs> give people the information they need to know to be successful, I found it really doesn't matter what generation they are. If you're going to, you know, be engaging and challenge people and make them think and bring in the effective domain of, I have tons of stories, uh, bring in that effective domain. I don't care if they're a millennial, a Gen Z, uh, or, uh, you know, whatever it is I'm supposed to be coming back to school. I have found that people want accurate information given to them that they feel they need to know to be successful in what they're trying to do. And if you can do that in a reasonably entertaining fashion, a little bit of humor, a little bit of crying, um, I found it, it really doesn't matter. I, I agree with you. I really do agree with you. And I think it's, I think it's the nursing you, <laughs> the nursing you sees that because as nurses, we, we respect life as nurses. And it's an approach to life that caring and love is embedded within not just what we do, but in our character to even care about someone so tenderly and affectionately. And I think I, I am so happy for your time. This was, this was an awesome interview. I, I could talk to you for hours <laughs> and I'm gonna leave, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna leave links to your nurse transforming, um, I, I think it's an organization Mm -hmm. This is transforminghealthcare.org. Healthcare.org. And also the public utility model. If it's okay, I can leave that um, link as well sure. um, attached to this video. And I will definitely be in touch with you to let you know how my um, program is going within my community. And I really hope I have good results to tell you. Great. I should send you my, I wrote a declaration of independence for nursing too. Oh, you did. Oh, I would I love to send that to you. Actually, I got it copyrighted. So. Oh, oh, 
Perfect. Maybe we're going to use that in the future. All right. I'll email that to you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. My pleasure.